welcome everybody to the talk by Vlad Urechin. Am I pronouncing that correctly? There you go. Um, he is the uh, the author of a library, a library or a program called Mini Boxing, which um, which allows you to use generics and native types um, very at high efficiency, about 20 times faster than regular code, if I read that correctly. And um, and he is a PhD at the EPFL, which is surprisingly overrepresented this conference, I am starting to notice. Um, no longer, so. Oh, no longer a PhD. Uh, he is now a doctor, and, uh, and he, he, you left as soon as you could? Is that what happened? No, I'm still on campus. We, oh. I, I realized we had too many people from EPFL, so, oh, okay. so had to leave. He had to so leave, yeah, yeah. It's like you can, yeah. Give a, you can give a talk here, but you cannot be from EPFL anymore. Um, and uh, he, interestingly, this is not going to interest anybody except myself, but I'm doing the talking, so there you go. He worked on uh, staged SAC, which is a language based on SAC, the single assignment C, and that is ironically what I did my bachelor's thesis on. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it's a small world. Nice. That was, yeah, I, I was like, no way, that's unbelievable. Awesome. So, um, so I guess uh, I, I know for sure that this man is of great talent, because only people of, of the highest talent can work on SAC. So uh, this is going to be a great talk. Um, please give a very warm, warm and welcoming applause for Vlad. Thank you, thank you very much for an uh, introduction. So we're going to look at uh, the story of a parallel Scala library. And that's the library. Oh, my presenter does not work. And it works now. It contains the constructs used by the miniboxing plugin to optimize your code. And maybe before we go on, who here has heard of miniboxing? One, two, okay, not a lot of people, three. All right, so miniboxing is a compiler transformation for the Scala compiler. It's actually a plugin that modifies the way the Scala compiler works to give you better performance. What do I mean by better performance? So generics are not really efficient when they're used by primitive, with primitive types. And this is what miniboxing mini boxing addresses. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, fact, is the optimized constructs that the miniboxing plugin uses. And it uses them either automatically in the compiler pi pipeline replacing your existing construct or with programmer help. So what I would like to do now is do a, a little demo to give you an idea of why these are necessary and where they come in. Uh, throughout the talk, we're not a lot of people here. Uh, please stop me if things aren't clear enough or it's it's much better that you follow what I what I say and you're going to take all the messages uh, away. Okay, so let's play a bit. So here you can see a quicksort implementation, Implates quicksort, that is generic, takes an array of t and a, an ordering of t and sorts an array. After that, we've got the timing part, which tells us how long it took and an entry point which just creates an array and checks this, checks how long it took. So if you write Scala quick dot Scala, we should get some baseline for how long it takes Scala to, to run this. And that's about 4.3 seconds. I have a little script which is called MB Scala. It just includes in the class path and in the compiler uh, flags the mini boxing plugin. So if we run quick Scala through the mini boxing plugin, the first thing we notice is that we got a warning. And the comp the running time for the quick for our quick sort is not really changed. Let's look at the warning, what it says. The method quick sort would be when benefit from mini boxing type parameter t since in it is instantiated by a primitive type. So what we need to do on the other side, do you see well enough? Should I increase the font? Fine, okay. So what we need to do is just add the mini 
boxed annotation to T. Okay, hopefully we've satisfied the miniboxing plugin. Let's try to run again. Now actually it complains about MB array instead of array to eliminate the need for class tags and benefit from sim blah blah blah. Okay, what I'd like to, you to notice is that actually adding the minibox annotation made things worse. So at this point you might think, all right, miniboxing is really bad. By itself, and we'll see why, it's not going to increase performance. It might actually harm it. But with its warnings, it tells us exactly what we need to do, which constructs we need to, Scala constructs we need to change to make it faster. So in this case, we change the array to MB array. And here, I'm going to say MB array dot clone of the array that we have. All right, so let's try to run it once more. It still complains. This time it says upgrade from ordering to mini boxed ordering to benefit from mini boxing specialization. Let's do this while it works. So I need mini boxed ordering and I will need it here as well to get the implicits. Okay, and now you can see also the time is not good. We made the, this change and we run it again. You see there are no more uh, no more warnings and you can see the computation time is 1.6 seconds. That's about three times faster than a generic algorithm that a programmer would normally uh, write. So what I'm going to talk about today is to, to explain what these optimized constructs are and how, why they are needed and how, what to do to introduce them. All right, so we, do it, we can do it either automatically in the plugin or with programmer help like you've seen before for others. All right, so the main motivation revolves around the fact that we build all kinds of new constructs and paradigms, but there are some that are very deeply integrated in Scala. And I would give some examples such as functions, tuples, arrays, uh, all of these we might want to change. So for example, if you see a function, you automatically think of function x, scala.function1, function2. If you need to extend its behavior, such as let's add a method to it, you can easily do that. What about changing its behavior? For example, partial function. It has a different semantic than function. Well, that's what our, we're going to talk about today. And just to give you a, a, an idea of what is the difference between adding, uh, extending or, and changing behavior, I put here a couple of things that you might want to do to a class. For example, add a new method, make it conform to, to a certain interface. You might want to change a method signature. You might update the, the, want to update the body of a method or change the fields of a class. But if these uh, if you look at classes that are outside your control in a library that you don't control, there's a clear line between these two. Namely, you can always use an implicit to, to make certain things work, whereas for the other things you simply cannot do with, with the current machinery Scala gives you. So let's look at why would we need to get so intrusive as to change a class in, in the uh, a, a class in the library or in the Scala standard library. To do so, we need to understand a bit about miniboxing and how it works. And we're going to talk about three uh, things. The main part is the, the data representation. Who of you here are familiar with generics? Okay, erasure? Pretty much everyone. Okay, so I'll go quickly. What happens when you have a generic method at the bytecode level, at what the level JVM sees, is a method that takes an object, returns an object. So if you call it with a primitive type of value, such as five, it will create an object that stores this value. And this is called the boxed data representation. 
And it's not really efficient because it requires a lot of heap space for the object. It produces garbage that you need to collect, breaks locality and all around performance uh, overhead. So what we have right now in Scala is called specialization, which takes one of one such method, generic method, and creates versions of this method that work directly for the primitive types. That's all good. For example, if you call identity of five and it's specialized, you get uh, a specialized variant of identity calling called directly with the uh, primitive type, with the value. The problem with specialization is what if you have multiple type parameters? Suddenly it explodes. It creates a hundred ver versions of the method. Or if you had a class that had three type parameters, such as function two, suddenly that would blow up to a thousand versions of this class. So this is about the time I, when I started my PhD and I asked the question, can we do better? And an insight is that ultimately all primitive types in Scala can be encoded in a long integer. That said, we can, that was the main insight behind miniboxing, we just create two versions of the method. One takes an object, as before, and it can work with some, something like a string, a list, so a, a, a reference-based type. And the other one takes primitives. So far, so good. Uh, it encodes all primitives in a long, and this creates only two to the power of n variants. And of course, what happens when you call it, for, for example, identity of three, it will convert an integer to a long or to a mini box, but this conversion, and, and it will use the mini box variant. And unlike boxing, the key insight is that transforming a primitive type from one, repre for, from one uh, size to another is very cheap, does not involve the heap. So we've seen what miniboxing is about. Let's, let's now look at mixing representations. So if we, how many of you are familiar with the notion of a call graph? Okay, not so many. So let's, let's uh, imagine we have these three methods here. Foo calling bar, bar calling baz, and baz just returning the value. So if we were to call foo, we can look at exactly what calls would be made. So who would call who? Foo would call bar, and in turn bar would call bass. And then of course there's a return uh, the, going the other way. Okay, so far so good. What, hap what would happen if we had all of them mini box? I'm trying here to, to slowly get you to understand why the performance dropped when we added mini boxing. So bear with me here. So what would happen here? Anybody has any insight? All right, so we have two versions of each method and they all call, uh, they each call the, the object ones call themselves and the primitive ones call, call the primitive ones. So there's no mix up between these. All right, so the data is passed efficiently in primitive form. Now, can anybody guess what happens if one of the minibox annotation, annotations is missing? Exactly. So what happens is that we have these, this call graph that remains the same, and we have foo m and baz m that are left without a way to call bar m, because there is no such thing. So what foo m will do is box the, the value and call bar. And unfortunately, bar does not have information after erasure to reliably call baz m. So what happens is that we get into boxed generics and we lose all our performance. And it can be even worse in some cases. So what the miniboxing plugin would do in such a case is give you these warnings which tell you, all right, so the first one is saying I'm foo and I'm trying to call bar, 
but I don't have a, a better version of bar. And the second one says pretty much the same thing, but it says I'm bar, I know Baz has a better version, but I can't call it because I don't have the annotation. So both of them tell you, please, please, please add the annotation here. Okay, so far, are you with me? Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about library interoperation. So now we're getting into the explanation of why performance dropped initially when I added the mini boxed uh, annotation. So if we have this method that returns a function, so you can see the method is generic and returns a function from t to t. If we call it initially identity fun of three, it will let us know that hey, there's you you should annotate t with mini box. But once we notify uh, we we modify the method and added the mini box annotation, we should be getting the following warnings, which say Scala function one should have type parameter T1 and type parameter R marked as mini boxed. Of course, that's not actionable because you cannot go uh, and make a pull request to the Scala, Scala repo and say, I want to add at mini boxed to function, to function one. So we need to fix it somehow. And this is why this is the whole tension that uh, you that motivated this talk. The fact that there are some things that are done in a way in Scala, but we'd like them to be done differently. So of course the mini boxing plugin won't give you this these two warnings, and we'll see what it does. Well, functions are uh, transformed automatically to improved versions, arrays as you've seen, need user intervention, intervention, so you need to write something. Uh, that's because mutable state has problems with aliasing, so it would not be correct to automate it. Tuples are optimized automatically. Numeric could be optimized automatically, but I'm sorry I was lazy, so it just warns you and you have to do it manually. But it can be done. So we, we've seen why we need different constructs from what Scala the Scala library provides us. The most, interesting uh, the most interesting construct to replace is function because we have some very interesting insights. So we'll look at that. There is a, a version called, mini, a class called minibox function x and it's a replacement for function x. And the assumptions are that you create a function once and you're going to apply it many, many times. So we optimize for the minimizing the call overhead. And let's look a bit how we transform this. Of course, there are three possible approaches. One, I guess many, many of you here would think, oh, there's no problem. Function, let's say function zero has a type parameter it has at specialized, but we just put a at mini box on it and we hope to make it work. Fortunately, the transformations are not compatible, which makes it impossible to do that. Of course, there are always adaptation, pretty much like an implicit, where you say, just before calling, I'm going to adapt the arguments and I'm going to adapt the return. It's okay, it works, but there's an overhead. We said, we want to be able to call it with no overhead. And the final uh, solution that I was left with when developing this was to say, to give up and say, okay, I'm going to throw away function X and replace it with my own alternative. So it's not something that I wanted to do, I pretty much had to do it. And this is how it looks. When you compile this code, uh, in fact, what happens in the pipeline, and we'll see how, how that goes, it's the, the function is replaced by minibox function. And once this is done, miniboxing can do its own magic, which means that the anonymous class extending the, the trait will actually be extending the, the improved versions of function. Okay, so we have, as we've seen, multiple such things that we, we might want to transform. We'll focus on functions. And going back to the extending versus changing behavior that I, I explained earlier. So we, in this case, we're not even taking any of these here. 
we're doing something more. We're saying we want to completely replace uh, a library class. And today uh, I, I would like to thank, thank Sam Holiday, who's I don't see him around, but uh, he, he, ah, thank you. So he explained a couple of other use cases he has for just throwing away a class and replacing by it by something else. All right, so we've seen the functions. What is the problem with them and what do we do? Let's look at some insights for compiler hackers who, who write compiler plugins into the problems that you might have here and how to solve them. So dependencies, that's the first problem. Your, your library is never alone. It will depend on other libraries, on the Scala library, on Akka, on other libraries, which may or may not have the transformation. So what you need to do is talk to each of the libraries in its own language, right? You cannot pass a mini box function for a function or the other way around. So you, you need to be able to track what, which library uses what rep, uh, type of function. And here's an insight from, from the mini box, uh, from the Scala compiler. When you compile something with Scala C, you get two things. You get the bytecode that runs on the JVM and the, the high-level Scala signatures. And what are the, these high-level Scala signatures? Well, these are the, the types that you write in the source code that will be used when you compile the next piece of so source code uh, you will type check against these signatures. So imagine this is the Scala library. This, this signature will tell us that uh, trait function one has two type parameters and has an apply method that takes the first one and returns the second one. So what happens if tomorrow I decided to one of the libraries to suddenly change it and uh, use something else in it? Well, we'd get some bytecode that would no longer be compatible. So the JVM here, once we try to run it, would say there is an error, you're passing incorrect, uh, an incorrect value. What we need to do instead is, once we make a change to the program at, at the high level, also write it down in the signatures, such that the next time we, we uh, compile a source code, we know about these changes and we can uh, act accordingly. And the new bytecode, of course, will be able to communicate this with the bytecode above. So we need to keep track of changes to methods, fields, classes, traits, objects, pretty much everything. And we need to carry this information, we, we can carry this information along with the types uh, through, through annotations. And here's how to do it. Uh, who's familiar here with the Scala compiler phases? One, two, three. Not so many, but seems like... All right, so th this is what happens in the Scala compiler when you compile. It starts with parsing, resolving names, and goes all the way to generating J JVM code. So we'll know at the typer, after type checking the program, we'll know where function one will infer where function one appears. Pickler, on the other hand, is the phase that saves these signatures, these high-level signatures, in the class file. So you can see in between these two, we should be adding a phase that tells us tells the compiler exactly what transformations have been uh, added. For example, for identity fun, after typer will know it's the, the result is a function one. And in between the typer and the pickler, we'll annotate it with an additional piece of information that tells us, oh, we changed from function one to minibox function one. And there's another annotation we're adding, but we'll talk about this later. These are, will be visible the next time we compile the code. So uh, what if, what happens if Let's say we have an, a, a minibox function and uh, the caller expects a function one. Well, we need to convert it. I won't go into these details here because these are more 
like how we do it. But it's interesting to see just an example. So the identity fund, let's say, now we'll just call pre-def identity, which is erased. And it will, after the typer, this will be inferred as function one from t to t, and pre-def identity will have type function one from t to t. And it's taken from class path. What happens after typer, we add the annotations that we, we add each time. And we have here function one tt annotated, but this one is still function one with no annotation. And there's another phase that run af runs afterwards, which tells us, hey, look, this, there is a mismatch here between annotations. Let's, let's uh, harmonize the two. And to do so, it converts from one type of function to another. So this way, we still have the Scala library, we still have existing code that works as we expected, and our code is optimal. Okay, so for the conversions, you can see the, the website at slash LDL for more details. All right, so we talked about dependencies, but we also have reverse dependencies, right? Uh, for example, your library depends, but also other libraries depend on it. And let's say all of them are mini-boxed. In this case, it's simple, right? Everybody will call into your library with the mini-box function. What happens if, if one of them is not mini-boxed? Can anybody tell me what would happen? Well, the bytecode would be incorrect, right? So you would not be able, from that library, you would not be able, you would may be able to compile it, but after you compiled it, it would be incorrect bytecode. So uh, what happens right now is, let's say you defined identity fun in, a, in, a, in an object, compiled it with miniboxing, and afterwards started basic Scala without any additional mini boxing plugin. So what happens is when you call it, it will tell you this method was compiled, blah, blah, blah. So it will not let you compile against a method that has been transformed. How do we do that? Well, the key is this second annotation here, which is called compile time only. And it's built into the Scala library, recognized by stock Scala C and prevents compilation when, whenever it sees this annotation. And we can put a message here and we can tell the user, hey, you should compile this with the miniboxing plugin. Of course, uh, this is checked by another phase. So if we look again at the, the table of phases in the Scala compiler, we said we should introduce here the annotations and you can see ref checks comes just after Pickler. So in between these two, when the miniboxing plugin is active, it just removes these annotations again, such that here they're added, they're saved, and then removed, and the compilation can go on. But if it's stock Scala, here they won't get added, here they won't get removed, and anything from the class path that has the annotation will fail to compile. So far, are you with me? Ask me questions, if not. Okay, so you're very silent. Let's, let's go on to the object model because this is more accessible. So let's say we, you have a trait identity function, which promises this method and it's compiled with stock Scala, so no, no additional plugin. And let's say now we, you extend this uh, trait from, from an object and you add the mini boxed annotation so it gets transformed, the function gets transformed. What happens if you call the, the object uh, dot identity fun, you get the, the usual error. Yet, if you cast MB identity fun to identity fun, so to, to, the, uh, to the trait that was compiled with stock Scala, you can call just fine. So this is a way you can hide your transformed code 
behind an interface. And I guess many, many cases can be done this way to prevent a transformation, a complex transformation for, from leaking into the, the other code, into other libraries and code bases. All right, so the good things are there's no dependency on the plugin downstream in the reverse dependencies, but you have to write a little bit of glue code like you've seen before uh, here with the, with the interface. Okay, so we talked about all of these things. Uh, I'm going to show you an experiment that we did at EPFL uh, last year, just to give you an idea of uh, how much these uh, transformations are necessary. So it, it's a data structure called RRB vector, which is very similar to the Scala collections vector, but uh, additionally, it scales very well when you parallelize it. And this was implemented by Nicolas Stucki. It took about four developer weeks of work, heavily fine-tuned for performance. It scales and it scales very well. So we, when we started the experiment, we set out with the following question. Can we improve RRB vector with miniboxing? And how difficult would it be to do so? Well, uh, for the preparation, we copied the, the parts of the standard library that the RRB vector needed and eliminated some of the parallel execution support because we, we benchmarked in a single, execu single thread execution. Prepared some benchmarks and uh, let a student work on this to, to improve the, the code. So he's a he was a master student uh, working in the lab at that time. He was very experienced with miniboxing, but did not know the RRB vector code base at all. It took him 30 minutes to use all the warnings that the miniboxing plugin gave him to, to improve the code base. So that's 0 0.3 of the development time it took for writing the, the data structure and for optimizing as, mu as much as possible on the JVM. And the results are uh, around a 2x performance improvement. So you can see we have cert several micro benchmarks here, and there is a, a macro benchmark which shows even a better speed up. And you can, you might see that there's also a, a sub-unit number, so less than, than one, which is actually a slowdown when we use the miniboxing. And actually reversing a vector, it turns out, never needs, uh, always handles the values directly either in the boxed or the primitive format without modifying them at all. So this was actually faster without being transformed. Okay, so what did we use there? We used the minibox function, we used the miniboxed array, we used tuples, tuples and numeric and ordering in our examples. So all of these were necessary to make these data structures faster. We won't be able to cover the other ones today because that would take a lot of time, but uh, if you are interested, you can look up my thesis uh, on the EPFL website and you, you can read about how we did it and all the, the logic behind it. Okay, so we, I showed you the experiment we did. Uh, we saw another live code session on how, how quicksort uh, was faster with miniboxing and with, with the miniboxing library. So let's conclude. Where we need miniboxing library is to replace the Scala constructs that are not communicating efficiently with the modified code. We want to preserve the high, uh, high level nature of the code and the syntactic sugar, but we don't, and we don't want programmers to do so many changes in the code. So ideally we want to automate as much as possible. Uh, much of it is, opt, uh, is done in the Scala uh, mini boxing with with mini boxing, but also some parts need to be done by programmers. And I'd be interested in hearing your use cases. I showed you what 
why this was necessary for mini boxing, but maybe there are other things you could think of. Okay, so I have a few special thanks and uh, I I'd like to take any questions you have. Thank you very much. Yes. So the question is that if it works for value classes. Unfortunately, the value class transformation and the specialization slash mini boxing transformations are not compatible among each other. Uh, what is happening right now uh, at Oracle is they are developing an extension to the Java virtual machine that will enable a different type of specialization uh, at the J JVM level that will be compatible with value class. And to give you maybe a, an insight why this is not possible, uh, it's because uh, value, uh, specialization creates multiple variants of the class under a, a single interface, whereas value classes need exactly the opposite, right? You want to strip out the object and call the methods directly. Did I answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Either, ah, there. I see. Uh, yes, de definitely. So I, I tried miniboxing with Spire some time ago. And the, the fact that Eric optimized Spire so aggressively, looking at the bytecode, the, the results were mixed. In some cases, it was better. In some cases, it was worse. But we can try out. We can try out because somebody needs to, to really go in, into the bike if you want to squeeze the last bit of performance, ultimately. But yes, that's a, a good candidate. There. Yes, Miles. So I think I had actually a, a slide about this. So yeah, uh, what if mini boxing was in mainline Scala? That would solve the problem, right? There wouldn't be any need for these. So why is it not? Well, we, we learned a lesson from specialization, right? Uh, it's been a, it's a very intrusive transformation, and many of the things that once we tried them out failed because we did not think about them. So this is why I wanted miniboxing to stay outside for as long as possible. And once it proves its stability and its significance, meaning that everybody uses it, at that point we can think about merging it in. So that's, that's why it stayed. And this slide should tell you a little bit about how intrusive miniboxing is. Uh, Scala has 25 compiler phases and when you add the miniboxing plugin, it grows to 40. So it really needs to turn your program upside down. Maybe you could squeeze them into, let's say, 10. But it still needs to turn your program upside down to, to make it efficient. So I don't think we want to, to just push it in blindly without having ad a good adoption before. I think that's that's a good question. We Eugene has actually tried to make a fork of the Scala compiler that had macros built in. And the biggest problem is compatibility with all the other elements from the infrastructure. So you need IDEs, you need all the libraries recompiled. It's it's quite a bit of overhead to to do this. 
at least at this point, I don't feel that I have enough time to, to do a fork of, of the compiler and maintain it. Yeah, so in principle, that that's that's a chicken and egg problem, right? It won't ever get a lot of adoption until you push it out and people can just write at Minibox and it works. So far, what I could do is show that it's performing well on, on quite complex pieces of code. I guess we could try to, to merge it in a, a version of Scala and see what happens. And if if that works, we have the fork of Scala that has mini boxing as well. Thank you for the idea. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? I think I'm running out of time here. Okay. Uh, one question here. Yes. They they are actually appended to the class path. Oh, I see. Uh, monkey patching would not work because some of the signatures are burnt into the the code that compiled against. Th this is what what happens when you have let's say a dot scala b dot scala and b b depends on a. You need if you modify a you need to recompile B as well, right? That's because what exists in A is burnt into the bytecode for B as well. Think of trait A and let's say class B, which extends it. If you add another method to A, and this is exactly what I do in the minibox function. I add new methods and the, the code is no longer compatible. The bytecode is no longer compatible. OK, so if you have other questions, please get in touch afterwards. So we let Denise uh, start. Thank you very much.